All right, so this morning, um, I think recently I've been preaching a lot of, trying to preach a lot of edifying sermons and teaching sermons and things like that. Um, but this morning I'm going to be preaching a little bit of a harder sermon, maybe, maybe for some, I don't know. Uh, it's called hard preaching because the world will have a hard time dealing with this, but uh, more and more, I think the more I've grown, the less I see it as hard preaching because to me it's just good and it's the word of God, and it's truth, right? It shouldn't, it shouldn't be that hard. Sometimes it's hard for us when we're confronted with our sin. But uh, I'm, I'm just prefacing this sermon with just, you know, uh, the whole purpose of a sermon like this is if you are um, engaged in a sin like this, that you get right, that's the whole point. If you are not engaged in a sin like this, so that you would never get in uh fall into this type of sin, right? This is preventative as well as um, corrective, and please receive the message in the way that it is going to be uh, preached. It's going to come out hard because it needs to, because we have a tolerant society. We have a, a satanic world view out there that is being pushed to normalize and make sin not so sinful and not so bad and not, and not that big of a deal. And specifically, if you're wondering, Pastor Burns, what are you preaching about, right? <laughs> what are you talking about already? Fornication, okay? Fornication, it's a big deal. And it's something that the Bible talks about quite a bit. And just if you'll notice, as I'm preaching this morning, every reference is from the New Testament. Not that that even should matter. But this is not something that you could argue, well, that, that was done away in Levitical priesthood, that was done away. No, this is something that remains extremely important, and probably now more than ever, it's an issue that uh, is, it, it corrupts a society, okay? And, and we need to watch out for our kids' sake, especially, that this has become so normalized and people are now growing up and I don't know what all the stats are. I see them from time to time, but people are getting married much later in life now and they're kind of going out and they're doing different things. And they're, they're, they're basically, a lot of young people are just establishing marriage relationships without getting married. And you know what that's called? Fornication. Amen. And we're going to see what the Bible has to say about fornication and whether or not this is a big deal or should we just be like, well, whatever, everyone's doing it, so what? Well, you know what? God demands us to be holy. Amen. Look at uh, verse number one of 1 Thessalonians chapter four. The Bible says, furthermore, then we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as ye have received of us how ye ought to walk and to please God, so ye would abound more and more. So before we even get into what we're going to cover in the rest of this passage, he's saying, look, we're exhorting you that we've already instructed you how you ought to walk, how you ought to live, how you ought to live your life, right? We've instructed you in this and how you could please God. And we just want you to abound in that way, walking in that good way more and more and more and just keep living a better life and getting more sin out of your life. For ye know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. So he's saying we gave you commandments that Jesus told us to command you. These are from our Lord Jesus Christ. And then he says in verse number three, for this is the will of God. So you're wondering, I don't know what the will of God is in my life. You know what? Here's what the will of God is. Even your sanctification. God wants you sanctified. He wants you set apart. He wants you different from the world. He wants you to live a holy and clean life. Even your sanctification that ye should abstain from what? Fornication. There it is in black and white, just right off the bat. This is the will of God, your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication. That every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. When you are engaged in fornication, when you're engaged in that type of relationship outside of marriage, look, that relationship is, is only for marriage. It is set aside and set apart only to be had within the confines of biblical marriage. And when you're outside of that, you're committing fornication. And when you do so, it's a dishonor, it's unclean, it's unholy, and you ought to be ashamed of yourself if you're engaged in any manner of fornication. We have these vessels, our bodies, to serve the Lord with. 
And you not only that, and we're going to get into this a little bit later, you have the Holy Spirit residing within you. If you are born again believer in Jesus Christ, the Holy Ghost lives with, within you. Jesus is in you. And then you're taking that temple, that body, that vessel, and joining with another person outside of marriage in fornication and becoming one flesh with someone else. Look, that is, that is abominable in God's eye. That, that, is, that is something that is disgraceful. The Bible says, continuing on here, verse 4, again, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor, not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles, which know not God. Hey, the world does this. The heathen do this. They don't care about it. It's not a big deal to them. But you know what? Christians ought to have a better standard. Amen. We ought not to pattern our life based off of what's acceptable out in the world. That no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter, because that the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also have forewarned you and testified. You know what? God is the avenger. By the way, you say like, well, there's nothing wrong with it. There's nothing illegal. No one's going to do anything to me. You know what? Yeah, but God will. Amen. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Amen. And when you, when you are... You know, there's a difference between sinning ignorantly and sinning willfully in Scripture. Now, both of them are sin. If you sin ignorantly, you just don't know something's a sin, it's still a sin. You're still guilty. You're still going to be held responsible. However, the, the, the magnitude, the difference is if you don't know about something, yes, it's still a sin. Yes, you're still responsible for it. But God's going to show a lot more mercy on you if you don't know, then if you do know and you just are willingly and deliberately just continuing to sin. You cannot expect to just be blessed in your life if you're just going to go around and just have disregard for what your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ has commanded how you ought to live and just say, you know what, I'm just going to do this anyways. And that's about the worst you can do, the worst attitude you can have is to have that type of an attitude. Now look, we all will struggle with sin in our lives. And we ought to maintain the attitude that as much as is possible, I'm going to just try to continue to get this sin out of my life. But when you get to a point where you just say, like, you know what, I'm just doing this, and I'm just going to keep doing this, you're going to have serious problems with the Lord. Because now your neck has gotten real stiff, and you don't care what he has to say. And, and God help you, because... The Bible says here is the avenger of all such. And look, we forewarned you. We've testified about this. Verse 7, For God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. He therefore that despiseth, despiseth not man, but God, who hath also given unto us his Holy Spirit. You say, I despise that preaching. I don't want to hear anything about that. Look, you don't despise me. You despise God. Because mm -hmm. these are the words of God. Turn through to Galatians chapter 5. And specifically, look, there's a lot of sins, there's a lot of different things that, that I will preach about in weeks to come, but this morning we're focused on fornication, and one of the reasons for that is fornication, we're going to look at various lists in Scripture, and, and very significant lists, and fornication is almost always listed either first or second. Like, it's at the top of the list every time. There's a reason for that. Okay, these are things that God just calls out immediately. Like, look, fornication. Don't do it. You're not supposed to be like the world. The world commits fornication, yes, but you shouldn't because you should possess your vessel in sanctification and in honor. Galatians 5, 19 says this, Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery, fornication. Now, essentially, they're the same action, the same act, Adultery is if you're married and you're committing that act. And fornication is just if you're unmarried and committing that act. Both of them are outside the confines of your marriage. And or, adultery is listed first, then fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, all related. Idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. And, you know, we could go into every single one of those individually and talk about how wicked they are because they are. And they're being called out here and saying, look, this is the work of your flesh. 
That is not the work of the Spirit. That is not God working in you by doing any of these things. That is not, oh, I love this person, and we're going to have this perfect love, and we're going to come together in love, and we're going to have this relationship. Look, that's what the movies are going to tell you. That's what the music's going to tell you. But that's not what the Bible tells you. That is dishonorable, that is not holy, that is not sanctified, that is a work of the flesh. The Bible says, envyings, murders, drunkenness, reveling, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Amen. That's a pretty strong statement. And it's in there on purpose, to be a strong statement, to get you believers to look at this and go, Wow. Look at all these sins. This is why people don't inherit the kingdom of God. Now, obviously, once you're saved, you are saved forever. Amen. So even if you are guilty or commit some sin that's found in this list, it doesn't mean that you've lost your salvation. The point that's being expressed here is that, look, these are all the reasons why people don't go to heaven. Because of all these sins. Now, for you, thankfully, and we'll see this a little bit later, we're going to go to 1 Corinthians 6 later, Christ has died for you. Amen. So all of your sins are covered and they're paid for eternally. Yes, when God sees you, he won't see your sin because Christ paid for all of those. So you will be in heaven. But what we have to just make sure sinks in is that we don't go soft on any of these sins because these literally are sins that, you know, like this is what keeps people out of going to heaven. Amen. It's a sin like adultery. It's a sin like idolatry. It's a sin like witchcraft. It's a sin like fornication. That is why people don't just go to heaven. Amen. And these are works of the flesh. And this is what, if you're walking in the flesh, you're going to be doing. Flip back to, uh, to Ephesians chapter 5, or forward to Ephesians chapter 5. There are, we're going to look at a few of these places right now where it just keeps listing off these various sins and kind of makes the same, the same statement. Mm -hmm. And even though it's very similar wording in the scripture, we're going to keep looking at these. Why are we going to keep looking at these? Because if it's repeated frequently in scripture, then we ought to be paying more attention to it. Amen. I mean, doesn't that make sense? If the Bible talks about something, if, if, if a subject is brought up like one time kind of in passing, we can probably deduce that, okay, well, God's, if it's, bringing, if it's brought up at all in Scripture, it's going to be important. And we ought to pay attention to it. But the things that are, that are referenced more frequently are going to be more important. And the stuff that isn't mentioned as frequently, okay, well, then... It's going to be assumed that either it's extremely obvious or, uh, you know, like, like some of the sins mentioned in Leviticus chapter 20, for example, some of the death penalty sins, I think are extremely obvious. You don't have to keep talking over and over about some of the weird things that people can do. So they don't need to be referenced all the time. But those would fall into some of these categories anyways with the uncleanness and, and this other stuff. But... If you see stuff mentioned repeatedly and you've got a letter to the churches in Galatia, you've got letters to the churches in Ephesus, you've got letters to Thessalonica, you've got all these letters and all these epistles going out to all these different churches and you keep on seeing these same things popping up, you know what? That's important. Amen. It's like all these churches need to know about this. This is important. This is a big deal. Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 1, the Bible reads, Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us. And hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling sa savor. Walk in love. You say, oh, that's what I'm doing. My boyfriend and I love each other. My girlfriend and I, we love each other. We're walking in love. I mean, we're children of God, right? But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becometh saints. Mm -hmm. No, apparently the Bible says that's not love. Mm -hmm. That's not walking in love. That may be the world's definition, but it's not God's definition. He's saying it shouldn't even be once named among you. I mean, what a shit. Like, that should never even come up. Fornication, no. No. 
Wh who do you think I am? What kind of life do you think I live? No, I know how to possess my vessel in sanctification and honor. I'm not, I, I have nothing to do with fornication. And look, we need to have standards as believers. We need to look at the Bible and say, wow, don't even let it be named among you as become a saint. Okay, well then I better start leading a clean and a pure life and being honorable before my Lord and, and not getting sucked into the world's mentality and the world's mindset of going, well, it's not that big of a deal. I mean, probably this, and this has been pumped for a super long time. I know when I was growing up, the movie stuff, when, when kids get old enough to leave the house, right? 18 years old, 19 years old, whatever, and they start going out, it's like, oh yeah, they're going to go to college or they're going to go away and they're going to go party and they're going to have all this fun and they're going to, you know, end up sowing the wild oats. They're going to end up sleeping around, partying, having fornication. Look, it's wickedness. And you need to be aware of that, parents especially, and don't allow for that mentality, that mindset to creep into your kids' lives. You know what that means you need to do? One, you need to be monitoring what type of stuff is, is going in front of their eyes and going into their ears. And not allowing that to just continue to just be pumped and having that mindset promoted and pushed. And look, I love my parents. I think my parents did a, a, as good of a job as they could in an unsaved family you know, raising me. I, I appreciate all that they've done for me. I'm not trying to slam them, but I had access to all of the world's stuff, all the world's movies, all that stuff. And you know what? It had a big influence in my life. I can look back and see as a kid, the music I listened to, the movies I watched, all of that stuff, because it, it, it implants bad, unbiblical, false ideas, sinful ideas into your mind. You know, this, this whole concept of love gets built up. And it's, you know, I mean, I could I've got lyrics going through my head right now, through my head right now of songs I've listened to that just, you know, or, you know we don't. We don't need, uh, I don't need some man to tell me you're mine. I don't need to sign on the dotted line. I don't need any of that, right? It's uh, these types of music, this type of song, and, it, and it's promoted in the movies, all of that stuff. It's just a mentality. It's a mindset. It's a wicked, fornicating, adulterous mindset that is being pushed to get you to not be able to possess your vessel in honor. And look, it is a lust. It is a problem for many people to deal with. Especially when you're single, okay? Being able to, to keep your vessel in honor and fight off a desire, a lustly, fleshly desire that you have in your flesh to keep that under control. But you need to do so because it's a big deal not to. And we could even see the inherent ramifications of that sin just expressed in the world. Like, like God is already put cursings on fornication through disease. Just the fact that, hey, if you're promiscuous, just be prepared to get disease. That's huge. Or how about this? You start having children out of wedlock, you're going to come into poverty, especially as a man. I mean, you're just, you're just shacking up with people and you, you don't really want to have a relationship, but you want to have that relationship. And then you wind up having kids that's going to cost you. And that's just reality. It's cold, hard truth. It just happens. But you can control whether or not that happens. And then on top of that, you got people committing murder and adding even worse sins on top of their fornication. Oh, I don't want to have this child. So let's kill it. And then you got the world telling you that that's not murder and that's okay. And it, you know, it's all wickedness. It's, it's, it, I can't even imagine the wrath that God feels over people not only committing the sin and then on top of that committing murder. Like, it's horrible. Let's keep reading here in Ephesians 5, look at verse number 4. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For this ye know that no whoremonger nor unclean person. And look, whore and whoremonger ought to be brought back in common usage. Because when people had higher standards in this country, that is the type of language that was used. Women that were promiscuous were called whores. And men, 
you know, that shouldn't be exalted either. It's not, they shouldn't be called a stud. They should be a whoremonger. Because that's not right either, no matter, no matter which side of the coin you're looking at, the male or the female. That's not right either way. It's fornication on both sides, and it's wickedness. No whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Wow. Said it again. Verse 6, let no man deceive you with vain words. For because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Don't be deceived. Don't be deceived by the world. Don't be deceived by the vain words. They're going to try to deceive you into thinking it's not that big of a deal or it's not that bad or, oh, what's God going to do about it? Look, those are vain words. The wrath of God comes upon the children of disobedience. Be not ye therefore partakers with them. Have nothing to do with that. Flip over here to Colossians chapter 3. We've seen Galatians, Ephesians, now Colossians chapter 3. And verse number 4. Colossians 3 verse 4. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth. What does that mean? Fornication. Number one. Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry, for which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. Are we seeing a pattern here? Are we seeing how angry God gets and saying, this is the reason why God's wrath is poured out. Amen. Fornication. It's not some minor issue. It's not some little thing. Flip back, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. First Corinthians 6, we'll see again Another list in the same type of way, the same type of context, talking about people who aren't going to inherit the kingdom of God, people who aren't going to heaven, people who, who because, of those sin, because of these sins, look, they're not going to make it. And it's not because it's, you have to work real hard to be saved. It's just a free gift. But if people didn't have all these sins then you would just go to heaven because you wouldn't need to be saved, right? But all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, which is why we need to be saved. But look at verse number nine here. And we, we just, this teaching is so important so that we don't just be like, oh, I just get saved and everything's fine, right? And on the one hand, it's, yes, everything's fine in the sense that you're going to go to heaven, right? So that's, that's great. It's, it's, it's really good news. But it's not fine in the sense that just like to, to have this attitude and just be real flippant about sin then just because, well, I'm saved, right? So who cares? Whatever. Yeah, yeah, I'm a sinner. Yeah, but we're all sinner too. Yeah, okay, <laughs> yeah, I sin, you sin, whatever. That is a wicked attitude to have. That is not right. We need to constantly remember how, how bad sin is. The wages of sin is death. Okay, and that's obviously a spiritual sense. Yet there's a spiritual de death, but also physically. Okay, don't think that you're just going to be able to go through this life and just, just sin it up as a child of God and not reap some judgment for that. Just because you won't go to hell doesn't mean God is not going to chastise you and punish you in this life. And when you understand how angry God gets about things, maybe we should make efforts to not do those things. And I mean... Not just, well, I tried, I tried not to do it, but it just happened anyways. No, I mean, you make, sh you ensure that this is never going to happen. Like, let me put it this way. In your marriage, if you're married, you could make sure you never commit adultery. Did you know that? I mean, you could just make sure that never happens. You can do that. Well, how could you be so sure? You're pretty confident. Because when you treat it as something that's like one of the worst things in the world that you can do, you can make sure that that's not going to happen. Amen. 
You can change your life enough to say, you know what, I am never going to allow myself to get close enough to anybody to be able to get in a position where I start to have feelings for someone else to then where I'm going to start trying to uh, commit adultery with someone else other than my wife. You can do that. Yeah, it takes a little effort. Yeah, it might mean a change. Yeah, you might need to do some things different, but you can do it. You can do it. And it's really not that hard. And when you, if you love your spouse enough and you love God enough, you can be like, man, I want nothing to do with that sin. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do everything I can to make sure that that never happens. Verse number 9, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Bob reads, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Be not deceived. What's that first sin mentioned there? Neither what? Fornicators. I think we're seeing a pattern here. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Same type of list as we've already read in Galatians, Ephesians, and Colossians. But this continues on. And this is, this is I love going to this list specifically when I'm talking to people who get confused about, you know, being able to lose your salvation or things like that. Because this will clarify, hey, even though all of these things, you know, you commit these things, you don't, you know, you're not going to heaven because of these things, if you're an adulterer, if you're a, a fornicator, if you're covetous, you know, all these different things. But here's the difference between those who are saved and those who are unsaved. It says in verse 11, And such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of God. So, God does, even though you may have commit fornication, and technically, you're still a fornicator because, look, you know, this is, this is a concept I love to, to show people at the door. How many people do you have to kill to be called a murderer? Right? Just one. Now, after you kill someone, you will always be known as a murderer because you killed somebody. Right? And every other sin that you commit, it's the same thing. You've told a lie. Well, now you're a liar. But I don't lie anymore. Well, I don't kill anymore. But you're still a liar because you've lied. Does that make sense? So this is what you become because of what you've done. But when you get saved, all sin is, is, is purged and wiped away. Right? So it's, 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 it's as if you didn't do those things, which is why you're no longer a fornicator, why you're no longer an adulterer, why you're no longer a murderer in God's eyes because Christ's blood has covered all of that. So that's why you're allowed to go to heaven because that has all been washed aside. And people who don't have Christ, that is still what they are. Does that make sense? I mean, this is what the Bible's teaching here, but it's so important to remember that, hey, just because you've been cleansed and washed of your sin doesn't mean it's still not a big deal. I mean, this is, this is literally why, though, people aren't going to heaven. This is why people don't inherit the kingdom of God. Verse 12, he continues, he says, All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Meats for the belly and the belly for meats. But God shall destroy both it and them. And look, all things are lawful because we're free from the law. But it doesn't mean it's all good. It's not expedient. It's not right. And then he says this in the middle of verse 13. Now the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. All New Testament teaching. This is important. And, and kids especially, listen up. Okay, this is something that you're going to be tempted with maybe growing up. And some, depending on how old you are, you might not even know what I'm talking about. And that's okay, but try to understand as much as you can. You'll understand later how important this really is. You just learn right now, fornication, really bad. Fornication is terrible. You never want to commit fornication ever Amen. in your life, ever, not one time. It is a big deal. Why? Because the body is not for fornication, but it's for the Lord. Amen. God owns your body. 
Christ died on the cross to pay for you and for your body, to not just to redeem your spirit and your soul, but also your body. They all belong to Christ. Look at verse 14. And God hath both raised up the Lord and will also raise up us by his own power. Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ. <coughs> your body, who you are, you are part of the body of Christ. Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of an harlot? God forbid. So you think about that. You say, hey, I'm a believer. I'm part of the body of Christ. You are joined unto Christ as a believer, as a child of God. Are you going to take now part of the body of Christ into that level of wickedness? He's like, are you going to go have a, you know, be with a prostitute? You're, you're going to join Christ in that way? I mean, think about that. God forbid. Verse 16, what? Know ye not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body? For two, saith he, shall be one flesh. That act, and this is one of the reasons why this is brought up first so often, because this sin isn't like every other sin. There's many sins that have a lot of different commonality. And this sin specifically, though, is a sin that you're doing in your body when you are making yourself join and be one flesh with someone else, which is uh, set aside strictly for marriage. That is the union within marriage. But when you do that outside of marriage, you're, st you're still doing the same thing. You're still becoming one flesh. But now you're doing it outside of God's authority of God's commandment and it's sin and it's exceeding sinful because now you've you've made yourself a member of Christ become one flesh with uh, with someone else that it, you're not married to and therefore bringing the, the member of Christ and kind of and, and just making that uh, that sinful union but he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit look at verse 18 flee fornication flee what does it mean to flee? Run away from. Like, get away as fast as you can. Flee fornication. Set up bounds. Set up rules to make sure that you are far away from fornication. Because the touching and the getting real close and everything else that you do brings you closer and closer and closer to committing fornication. If you're not married, keep the distance. Stay as far away as you can from fornication. Because the closer you get, the easier it is to, fall, to slip and fall. And oops, it happened. Oops, I allowed my lust to just take over. Which is why the Bible says we're going to read this here. It's good for a man not to touch a woman. Yep. It's good for a man not to touch a woman. Yep. Why? Because the touching is going to lead to more touching. Yep. It's going to make you want to do more things. Because that's the way your flesh operates. Get some wisdom before you get involved in some grievous sin that God is not going to bless you over. And these stupid mindsets, look, I've heard them all and I probably thought them all. Oh, well, we're going to get married anyway, so who cares, right? No. Before you're married, it's fornication. Amen. Mm -hmm. And I can't tell, I mean, there's countless stories of people who had that mindset and guess what? They don't get married. And they've given up their purity. They've given up their virginity. And they've given up that special, that, that so special virginity for someone else that they didn't even end up marrying. And they commit fornication. Something else happens. Because look, your relationship changes. It's going to change after having that physical interaction. Because there's a lot of things going on. There's a lot of blessings in having that relationship with your spouse. But that's what it's designed for as a spouse, which is why God instituted it that way, which is why it's not just about procreation. It's not just about having babies, because then why would it matter to be married? You could, if it's just about having babies. Well, it's not just about having babies. There's a lot more to it than that. 
And there's a lot of blessings in marriage, a lot of blessings in a relationship and all that stuff. And look, God designed it the way he did and he knows better. Amen. And you need to just make sure that you are fleeing fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you? Which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. You belong to God. Your body isn't yours. And look, I'll, I'll preach on this passage and, and preach against smoking and drugs and all this other stuff because they're applicable. But you know what? The primary purpose and the reason this is given in context is about fornication. Your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost. Don't defile your body. Don't defile the temple of the Holy Ghost. I mean, what, what, think about this. Would you go, if there was, if there was the, the, the temple to the Lord standing here today, that was ordained of God, that we should all go, and there's a holy and the holiest of holies like there was in the past. Let's just say what we lived in that time. Would you have the audacity to go into such a place and just start tearing it down, getting paint buckets and throwing it in there, graffiti, and just, and just tear it? Like, would you do that to God's holy place? Would you defile it like such? That's what you're doing when you're committing fornication and you've got the Holy Ghost residing inside of you. You're just trashing the place. You're trashing the place where the Holy Ghost lives. That's what you're doing. Let's call it out for what it is. That's not very loving, is it? Chapter 7, let's keep going because this thought continues in 1 Corinthians it actually started in chapter 5. We're going to end in chapter 5. We see how much of chapter 6 is dedicated to fornication. And now continuing into chapter 7, where the Bible says, Now concerning the things whereof you wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. So notice how Touching a woman and fornication are being tied together there. It's good not to touch a woman, but hey, in order to avoid fornication, then just get married. And that's what God allows you to do. Hey, oh, you're having this, this feeling, you're having this desire, you want to have this relationship? Then get married. Amen. Get married. Then great. Amen. That's good. Well, I don't know if I want to marry. Then don't have the relationship. Well, I don't know if this person's right for me. Well, figure that out first and keep your vessel in sanctification and honor and just keep reminding yourself, hey, I belong to God. Hey, I've got the Holy Ghost with me. Hey, I want God to bless me. I want God to bless my life. I want God to bless my future. I want God to bless me with children. I want God to bless my marriage. Then why don't you do things God's way? The results of fornication... Can, can have consequences that last you for a lifetime. That once it's done, you can't just undo. You can't go back. You can't, you can't change anything once it's done. You have a child out of wedlock, guess what? <laughs> that child's not going anywhere, right? Unless you murder it. It's not going anywhere. Now you're going to have to deal with that. And maybe that, maybe that person isn't the one that you want to marry and commit to and spend the rest of your life with. Well, you got a child with that person now. Now you're, going to, you're, just going to, you're stuck automatically with that and dealing with that just for the rest of your life. And unfortunately, sadly, these days, you're hard-pressed to even find a family that doesn't have to deal with the divorce, with the kids out of wet, you know, with all of this stuff. Like everybody has to deal with this. So you should all know firsthand, probably, I mean, hopefully not, but probably you all know firsthand the impact that this has on families, on relationships. All these different kids, different moms, different dads, whatever. And look, it's all because of sin. It's all because of fornication. And look, if you've, if you've committed this in the past and you're married and you're, you know, and you're trying to live for God and everything like that, 
I'm not just saying all this to make you just feel horrible about yourself. Look, if you've already repented, you're right with God, then amen, right? You can't change it. But the point is, you can't change the past. I'm not going to not preach on this. Hey, look, if you're right with God, then praise the Lord. That's, that's, that's what you can do at this point going forward. Anyone. That's the best we can do right now is just get right with God and do right from this day forward. And that's what I want you to do. But also, I want the kids to never go down that path. Yeah. Ever. Okay, maybe you made that mistake. That's too bad. But let's train the kids not to. And how about this? Let's be a good example for the kids not to do that. Flip back to chapter 5, 1 Corinthians chapter 5. If we haven't already understood the importance of this, if it hasn't been underscored by the passages we read, and look, I didn't even turn to, the Bible talks about, you know, Tens of thousands of people who have died in the Old Testament because of fornication. Died. Lost their life. That's how anger God got 70,000 people dead in the wilderness. Or the sin of Baal Peor. Fornication. It's a big deal. But how about this? 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, which, by the way, this is a passage that we all should have memorized. This is important. And, and you know what? This church, we, we try to do everything according to the Bible. And we don't use man's wisdom and try to come up with excuses why we're not going to do things in a biblical way. We're going to do things the way that the Bible says. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, as we're going to read here, there are certain sins that are bad enough. Yes, we know we're all sinners, but there are certain sins that are bad enough that the Bible says that as believers, you ought to be separating your company from other believers. And that people shouldn't even be allowed in church because you're going to be congregating, fellowshipping together when you're found out to be guilty of these sins. And I wonder what might be on that list. Let's read 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse number 9. I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators. So now this is the Apostle Paul instructing the church, saying, look, I've written to you in the past telling you not to keep company, not to, not to be hanging out with fornicators. But he says this, he, he wants to clarify what he had written earlier. Verse 10, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world or with the covetous or extortioners or with idolaters, for then must ye needs go out of the world. So he's, he's making a distinction here. He's saying, look, if you just had nothing to do with the fornicators and covetous and idolaters in, like, in the world, then you couldn't really talk to anybody. <laughs> That's what he's saying, because the world's just that bad, right? There's just so much of this stuff out there. Then basically, I'm just be telling you, you're just going to have to move away from everybody. And, not, and look, we're in the world. We're not of the world. We're in the world. We've got to deal with the world. We've got to deal with people. We've got to talk to people, whatever. But there's going to be a difference between the heathen, between the Gentiles, between the world, as the Bible is describing them, and believers, and the, the body of Christ, and those who are sanctified in the Spirit. There's a difference. And he clarifies this in verse 11. But now I have written unto you not to keep company if any man that is called a brother... Be a, what's first on the list? Fornicator. And, and you know, that's what I point this out too. Any man that is called a brother. So this whole concept, the notion of the man, oh, he's got all the ladies and stuff, and how cool is that? <laughs> Not in the church of God. Amen. Oh, you're a brother and you're a fornicator? You're a wicked person. I'm not, I'm not even going to hang out with you. I'm having nothing to do with you. That's not cool. That's the exact opposite of cool. No, we're not. Nope. Drawing the line. But let's keep reading here. But now I've written unto you, not to keep company of any man that is called a brother, be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner. With such an one, no, not to eat. He's saying don't even go have a meal with that person. Why? Because that's how bad it is. 
This isn't every sin. Well, we can't eat with anyone then. Uh, no, you tell me you can't find someone who doesn't fornicate, who isn't covetous, who isn't an idolater, who doesn't rail on people, who isn't a drunk and doesn't extort people? But come on. There's plenty of people that aren't just guilty of all these things. And, and I've spent time, you could see sermons in the past where I've gone more in depth on all of those specific things, okay? But we're focusing on the fornication. You're either a fornicator or you're not. You're either involved in fornication or you're not. And I want to make this point clear too, because when the Bible says here, it says, any man that's called a brother, you will always have... As we continue to reach people with the gospel, with the good news, and people are getting saved regularly, there are babes in Christ that may be in this condition. Like, I mean, you just got saved, right? So, so does that just mean all of a sudden, hey, congratulations on getting saved. Okay, I can't have anything to do with you now. <laughs> That's not what that means, okay? Here's the thing. Discretion needs to be used. People need an opportunity to grow, but these sins are very bad. So it shouldn't take too long. But when it says that someone who's called a brother, it's someone who is established enough to know like, oh yeah, you know, like, like brother so-and-so, sister so-and-so, like, you know, you're saved. They've grown enough to know like these truths. I mean, first of all, you can't just be like, I mean, so I didn't even know. I mean, my wife is a perfect example. There's a lot of things because she grew up with like pretty much no religion at all. Didn't know many things were like sinned and spelled out in the Bible. It's like, you can't do these things. Obviously, some things are inherently, you just know like murder is wrong, right? But, but there's other things that if you don't know any better and no one's ever said anything and you never knew what, what the Bible said and stuff and, and, and you're brought up among people who think that some other things are just fine, you wouldn't inherently just know. So, you, so people need to have that opportunity to under, like, whoa, okay, look, look now I know that this, is, you know this isn't right and that's not right and this is wrong. So obviously grace is extended. For people, you know, for especially new believers, new converts, people are coming to church to learn. But you know what? These are big deal sins and they ought to be dealt with like first and foremost. I mean, if someone comes in here that's a drunk, hey, praise the Lord. I want them to grow. I want, you know, they, they get saved, but they're a drunk. It may be difficult, but, you know, we want to help them through that and get them to not want to be a drunk. There's a difference between that person that we're trying to, to, to help and reach out to and, and, and provide the support and they want to change and they're trying to do what's right and they're repenting of that sin versus the person who's been coming to church for this long time and then decides to pop open the bottle and they're just getting drunk at home every week and you know trying to keep under wraps but then it's found out like dude you just want to get drunk like two different things do you see what i'm saying so like there's discretion that we use here but at the end of the day People are going to need to grow enough to the point to be able to see, like, look, this is, this is wrong. I can't be doing this. And these sins specifically, I mean, how, how long is it going to take for someone to learn that you shouldn't be extorting people? And how long does it really take for someone to learn, hey, I shouldn't be a drunk? Right? How long does it take for people to realize, hey, I shouldn't be fornicating? So it doesn't have to be some immense amount of time but at the same time it's not immediate for new new believers new converts whatever right what have you so but if you've been around for a while you know better people that know better you know if i find out that you're living in fornication that you're a drunk or you know any of these other sins then you know what we're gonna you're not gonna be welcome at this church Because what does the Bible say? It says, with such a one know not to eat, but let's keep reading verse 12. For what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within. This is said, like, this is condemning if you're not judging those that are within. 
Oh, how dare you judge? Well, because we have God's judgment. We have the Bible that judges. We have God telling us what's wicked and what's not. We have God saying how bad this is. So, of course, we need to judge them that are within, but them that are without, God judges. Look, the people out in the world, God will deal with them. We don't have to, but those within, we have to deal with. Therefore, put away from among yourselves that wicked person. Okay? The Bible is calling these people wicked. That's not me putting that label on someone. That's the Word of God saying, put away from among yourselves that wicked person. And I'll say this too. When this type of church discipline is executed where people are going to be not welcome at church, you are not doing that person any favors if you're going and saying, well, I'm still going to be friends with that person. I'll still go out to eat with you. I still care about you. I still want this. Look, first of all, I never said we don't care about those people because we do. But people have this false idea of saying, oh, well, I still care about them more and I'm going to try to help them. No. The reason why, look, you have to get rid of and stop leaning on your own understanding and what you think is a better way of dealing with a problem than what God has already told you to do. Because when things are so bad, there needs to be what's called tough love. And these things we don't look forward to. I don't want to have to enforce these things. I don't want to because it's not fun at all. It's not pleasant. It's, it gr it's grievous in the heart. When you, if you find out that someone's guilty of these things, it's like, man, there's a brother that's, that's guilty of this, and I, and, I, and I don't want to, you know, but it's what's right. And at the end of the day, if it's right, and if it's what God says to do, then that's going to be what's best for that person. Because here's what the Bible also teaches. Look, if someone is repentant then, of whatever this in my list, let's say someone gets kicked out because they're, because they're a drunkard, because they're a fornicator, because whatever, there are any of these things on this list. But then they say, look, I've repented. I'm no longer living in fornication. I'm no longer doing this. Welcome back. We love you. I'm, we're glad you're here. We're glad you're back. And that will never be brought up anymore. Again, it's done. It's done. Because there's no reason to bring up anything that people have done in the past just to throw it in their face. It's forgiveness. But the repentance has to be there. Because if you're still actively engaged in this behavior, the Bible says, put away from among yourselves that wicked person. That's what the Bible says. And this should show us how serious of a problem this is. And, and if this is a problem, you know, whether you have it or whether you might be going that direction, start to realize how big of a deal this is. And, oh, would to God we could have a generation of people, of kids, and if, and if not in the world, at least amongst churches and, and, and people of God where children can grow up in sanctification and honor and know how to possess their vessels and, and be pure and be able to experience what God has intended for them through their purity without going outside to fornication. And there is, I mean, I can go on and on and you can, you can read up even data that the medical community can share with you about the number of partners and all this other stuff, it has psychological impacts. It has physical impacts. There, there is there's a bond that's created that, that is not undone. Okay? Through that relationship. It... It's, it's so much bigger than people often even think about. It really is a big deal. It really is a big deal. And the, and the most blessing that you can have on your children in, in their physical life and in their growth with, with just how they're, you know, if they can go to the, to, the, to the altar, get married, pure. Moms, dads, Watch out for your kids and protect them. And, and even if they don't understand how important that is for themselves, because oftentimes kids don't, right? Kids are foolish so many times and aren't as strong over their lusts and over their flesh and, and, and will get influenced by, by the wrong sources. We need to watch out and help protect them as much as you can. And, and raise them right and nurture and admonition of the Lord and, and, and just help them as much as possible to be pure so that they can have that great relationship with their spouse one day 
and, and be able to, to also be in just really good graces and standing with God, with the church, and, and with other believers. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the warnings uh, about sin in Scripture. I pray that you would please help us to put up the safeguards in our life that we wouldn't, um, we wouldn't be guilty of these things, that we can avoid these things, dear Lord. And God, I pray for the, for the younger generations, Lord, help, help them to uh, help us as parents, help us as adults to set forth good examples, to teach our children well and to, and to keep them from uh, even the possibility of these things happen. And just as much as we want to avoid adultery, Lord, help us to ensure that, that fornication won't happen as well. And God, we love you. We thank you so much for guiding us and, and giving us the truth in these areas. And it's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.